Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. Welcome to this first inaugural lecture under the umbrella series of uh, SDGs and, and Dharma uh, traditions. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you all here. Um, uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful speaker who will be introduced, of course, in a moment. Uh, but I just wanted to also introduce uh, quickly and briefly Dharma Alliance. Uh, it's a tax exempt, not for profit entity which was set up in Geneva recently. Uh, and the general, um, the reason it was set up really was because uh, we found that, that Dharma, I mean, given the kind of um, uh, the situation we find the world is in, and there's a lot of upheavals, there's a lot of uh, uh, anxieties, there's a lot of uncertainty. We found that uh, Dharma traditions have a lot to offer to the world. And uh, for, uh, and, and of course, there are of course 1.5 billion people who are <laughs> subscribed to Dharma traditions at the very least. And uh, we found that there is no platform really here in, uh, in, in the cent one of the centers of international governance, uh, which really portrays and takes forward some of the messages of Dharma. And what are, and of course that brings us to the fundamental question, what is Dharma? So it's, it has many manifestations of course, uh, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very inclusive concept, but the primary principles behind Dharma are really uh, related to the idea of, uh, of, of harmony, of mutual respect, and fundamentally the interconnectedness of us all and of all life really. And then as we dug deeper, and then uh, we found that if you look at the etymology of the word Dharma, this itself comes uh, from the root three, which means to sustain. And then it was a very simple thing that that which sustains the ethical, the moral, the spiritual, the natural principles which sustain the universe, in fact. And uh, that's how this whole idea came up. And then we finally uh, established Dharma Alliance. And uh, then, of course, as Dharma means to sustain, the idea of linking it to the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, was something which was, uh, which was quite stark and that's something which we wanted to contribute towards. Uh, and uh, that discussion and discourse. So that's broadly sort of uh, and very simply and very essentially how Dharma Alliance came into being. Uh, we are very, very fortunate uh, that all of you are here. Uh, and of course, we are particularly fortunate that uh, uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador uh, of, uh, of India and the, to the permanent uh, and the permanent representative to the uh, United Nations uh, of, uh, to, to India is here with us. And uh, we are very grateful that he could come and grace us with his presence. And just to kick off things, I think, and, and I also know that he has a very deep understanding of Dharma and sustainability. So just to kick things off, I'd uh, request him to have a quick uh, you know, introdu introduction to the idea itself and to the concept itself. And uh, uh, we'd like to welcome Ambassador Indira Mani Pandeji, please. <laughs> Namaskar. A very good evening to you all. Uh, very happy to be here and uh, I thank Prashant for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. Uh, I remember meeting with him in my office where we uh, initially talked about uh, Dharma Alliance and then what it can do. Uh, how we can take this idea forward. He himself described uh, his own concept of uh, the contribution that uh, this alliance can make here discourse in Geneva. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, Geneva and the presence of a number of international organizations, we find that even though SDGs related deliberations and discussions were held in New York, and in 2015, they were defined in 17 distinct goals, but a lot of work related to sustainable development is carried out in Geneva also in different international organizations. So Geneva is uh, the right place to have this kind of discussion. Uh, I think uh, many of you understand the concept of dharma, so and it was very beautifully explained uh, what I feel that 
the contemporary challenges that we are dealing with, whether they relate to international peace and security, uh, whether they relate to the challenges that we face in recovering from COVID pandemic, its impact, the challenges that we face because there is a conflict in the heart of Europe uh, between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, uh, and the impact of that conflict uh, globally. Uh, also, the challenges that we face in terms of setbacks that we have in implementation of sustainable development goals. I think there is no country which today can claim that uh, it has been able to reach the halfway mark in uh, realizing those sustainable development goals. And that's why in New York in September, there will be a meeting of the member states of the UN to see how we can accelerate uh, implementation of sustainable goals. Naturally, uh, India, which is uh, currently holding the presidency of G20, we have set one of the goals of our presidency is to find ways and means to accelerate implementation of sustainable goals. Of course, member states will discuss and deliberate on sustainable development goals. They would agree on certain measures, how to accelerate implementation. Essentially, then it is left to the member states of the UN to implement them, or find ways. But uh, when we look at the way we have been implementing these sustainable development goals, we also need to look at whether we are we have been following the correct path or is there need for course correction? And if we need to do course correction, what kind of course we should choose for ourselves? Where do we look for new ways and new ideas to do things in a better way, in a more sustainable way. And uh, uh, this thought that, why don't we look back and look at our ancient texts, whether they are religious texts or they are non-religious texts, and see whether there are ideas, there are concepts that can be very relevant for us today in dealing with our contemporary challenges. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Dharma Alliance has started this lecture series because uh, what we are trying to deal with today is promote broadly, very broadly, welfare of the entire humanity, uh, welfare of the human beings in different situations, in different countries, in different contexts. And that's what we have been doing since time immemorial. This is not something new for us as human beings. Our ancient civilizations, societies have grappled with very same questions that we are trying to grapple with today. Peaceful coexistence of different religions, different cultures, different societies, different nations. They grappled with those uh, challenges. They grappled with the challenge of how to coexist with nature. And these are the very same challenges that we are dealing with today. So we cannot be arrogant in believing that we know everything, that there is everything that is to be known we are aware of. Perhaps we can find better ways to dealing with some of these challenges if we look back and try to understand the way in ancient contexts our different civilizations try to deal with them. And uh, that is where I think we the, the, what we call dharmic traditions, uh, many of them originating in India, can be very relevant. Uh, I would like to conclude by just giving two, three examples. Uh, and they are very well known to you. Say the example of yoga, uh, an ancient Indian tradition of dealing with the entire issue of the challenges that we face today, of how to connect our body and mind together, how to uh, deal with the challenges of not only physical health, but also spiritual health, mental health, psychological health. And uh, 
in ancient india our sages look at looked at those challenges and they try to find some solutions for them so the globally we have benefited uh, from yoga and that why that's why the united nations had decided to uh, declare 21st june as international day of yoga that was the idea behind uh, united nations recognition that it's an ancient tradition but it can be very relevant to us today when we look at uh, the other dimensions of health for example ancient uh, traditional medical systems whether coming from india ayurveda or from china or from different parts of the world in africa in latin america every civilization every country has its own tradition of medicine we can benefit from them why should we have only one choice of modern system of medicine allopathic why shouldn't we have other choices available to us somewhere the the system has been created in a manner that uh, other choices are not available to us at the same platform at the same level the, where the other choices are so i cited these two examples uh if we look at the coexistence with nature we'll find many ancient traditions in our ancient literature which can help us actually in dealing with the challenges that we face today how to coexist with nature uh and uh i would here just like to mention very briefly and that's why we have uh, uh started a campaign in india which we would like to become a global campaign called lifestyle for environment because somewhere we need to look at our lifestyle if we want our civilization to be environmentally sustainable and again if we go back to our ancient tradition there is th- this thought available that uh, we need to coexist in harmony with where we exist so i'm glad that uh, you have uh, started this uh, lecture series i'm looking forward to lecture from uh, professor jacob and uh, i'll be very happy to join in future series to looking at different aspects of uh, sustainable development goals but uh, we can even in future go beyond sdgs and look at how ancient wisdom can help us in dealing with other global issues other global problems that we are grappling with uh, so i wish uh, great success for this particular initiative it's something we um, should have done years ago but i am glad it has started so from the permanent mission we will be happy to provide whatever support we can and i am again grateful to you for your invitation and thankful to you uh, that uh, i could be become part of this thank you thank you so much ambassador pande and uh, it's uh, really wonderful you could be here and thanks for all the support um i before i hand over uh, the and we must of course come to the real core of the of the of the lecture this evening quite quickly but just just one thing which did strike me that you know one of the things which we talk about in the context of dharma is the interconnectedness and in some ways it struck me that uh, an 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 interconnectedness that of bringing everybody together and actually geneva does that a lot too geneva is one of those places in the world which does bring people from all over together and connects us all so in some ways it's rather appropriate that we are doing this uh, here in geneva and we hope to continue to contribute to the global discourse i'd like to now hand over to quickly to our advisory board member professor jay krishna kumar who is a professor here at of econometrics here in uh, in in in, in unish and she's on our advisory board and uh, she will introduce the speaker and uh, then take it from there thank you so much thank you good evening everyone thank you very much prashant for this kind introduction so as prashant mentioned i am a professor uh, at the university of geneva i am a professor of econometrics i also teach in fact in the same building faculty uh, school of economics and management uh, i also teach human development 
so it's a pri privilege, pleasure, and honor for me to introduce the speaker as well as uh, the series, the series of S on SDGs and Dharma traditions. So maybe link, we talked about SDGs and we talked about Dharma. So maybe where is the link? I thought maybe short introduction on that so that we can introduce the series and then uh, go to the speaker. As we all know, in September 2000, the largest ever gather, gathering of world leaders adopted what is called the Millennium Declaration. It started all the way from there. This declaration was endorsed by 189 countries and was then translated into a set of goals called the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs. These were eight goals, 21 targets, and 60 indicators to monitor the progress of these goals, of the countries towards these goals. And these targets were to be achieved in 15 years at that time, so by 2015. In 2012, these goals were, were transformed and expanded into what is called the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, at the UN Conference in Rio on Sustainable Development. These SDGs are 17 goals, 169 targets, again to be met in 15 years, so by 2030, and 231 indicators decided by the interagency and expert group on SDGs. 248 in total, but some of them are repeated over many targets, so it makes it 231. These goals, so what are these goals? These goals cover all aspects of what we can generally call well-being. Economic aspects like food, income, infrastructure, employment. Social aspects like health, education, inequality, social justice. Political aspects, people's voice and participation in decision making. Environmental aspects, quality of air, quality of water, quality of land, shifting to renewable and, uh, and, and sustainable energy sources. Global partnership, international cooperation, peace, justice, and so on. So they, you can see that it already these goals provide a broad, multidimensional vision of well-being. But of whose well-being? Essentially of the human well-being. So you can ask, in fact, in one of the discussions I had, one of the biologists, I was talking to a biologist who said, why? There are millions of species in this world, so why are you focusing on just one of this, one among these millions of species? Of course, these goals also touch upon other species, and we say that we start stay, started saying that we have to preserve nature, we have to protect nature, we have to, you know, um, protect ecosystems and we have to protect maybe animal species, maybe not all, at least the endangered animal species and so on. But all that, I think there is a kind of a selfish um, motive underlying because we know that if we don't do it, we are doomed. The planet is doomed. So the same biologist, in fact, he said, when uh, if you want to protect and preserve nature, the best way is to just let it be. Don't touch it, you know. But we cannot not touch it because we need to survive. The human race needs to survive. And we depend on the natural resources. So the link is this. That is, the question is, how can we enhance human well-being while at the same time preserving, protecting, and enhancing maybe nat nature well-being? So that is the crucial question. So how to coexist or exist in harmony with nature, we said, nature with a big N, including everything. So how to coexist in harmony, I would say, take it even one, one step above, with our surroundings. So what is the surroundings? It can be one's neighborhood. It can be one's country. It can be one's continent. Let's go beyond that. It can be the Earth. It can be the, the, the Milky Way galaxy. It can be the universe. It can be the cosmos. If you believe in many universes, it can be the multiverse. So basically, you can go all the way up there to say that how to exist in harmony with everything, all that surrounds us. And that is exactly what dharma is all about. It is living in harmony with, in alignment with the surroundings. And so maybe we have in, in, a harm, in harmony with nature, inner nature, because the true inner nature is divine and outer nature with the big N that we talked about. So now we've probably come around a full circle to say that many ancient traditions have been advocating or advocated this living in harmony, in living in alignment with these surroundings over centuries and millennia. So what do these traditions have to say about sustainability and sustainable lifestyles?
as we see them now. How did they practice it? So that is the basic uh, idea of these series of lectures on SDGs and Dharma traditions. Now we're eagerly looking forward to listening to Professor Dr. Jacob de Rover on this and more. Before giving him the floor, let me now briefly introduce him. Dr. Jacob de Rover is an associate professor at the Faculty of Arts and Philosophy, Ghent University, Belgium, where he teaches comparative study of religions. His research aims to contribute to the research program called Comparative Science of Cultures and its study of Western culture against the background of Asian cultures. He has focused especially on the comparative study of politics, culture, and religion in Europe and Asia. He completed his PhD at Ghent University in 2005 under the guidance of his teacher, Professor S. N. Balagangadhara, professor, now emeritus, from the same university and who was the then director of the program. From 2005 to 2011, he was a postdoctoral fellow of the Research Foundation Flanders. And from 2014 to 2019, he was a research assistant professor at Ghent University. He's the author of many, many publications and books. And so I would just mention two of them. He's the author of the book called Europe, India, and the Limits of Secularism by Oxford University Press, and co-author with Sarah Claire Hout of Religious Conversion, Indian Disputes, and Their European Origins. His recent projects focus on secularism and its limits, religious conversion, secular law and false religion, separation of the temple and the state, all extremely fascinating areas to study for a deeper understanding of cultures. So it is with great pleasure and honor that I pass the floor on to Professor Jacob de Ruber. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me properly. Good evening, Your Excellency, and good evening to the organizers and founders of the Dharma Alliance. Thank you for the invitation to give this inaugural lecture, which puts a lot of pressure on my shoulders after not lecturing uh, for some time because of the COVID crisis. Now, unfortunately, I have to start with a gloomy picture. If you, I think most of us, perhaps all of us, when we think about the world that we will leave behind for our children and our grandchildren, for the next generations, it's not easy or it's difficult not to feel despair. Right? From the individual level, we see that more and more people are suffering from burnouts, depression, mental health problems of different kinds. And recently, a friend of mine who works with school children told me, well, up until now, it was school teachers getting burnouts. Now school children are getting burnouts. They don't want to go to school anymore. So from that level of the individual to our societies, our institutions, I mean, the war has already been mentioned, violent conflict is taking place in all kinds of places all over the world. In fact, the Pope of the Catholic Church at some point said, what we're going through is a piecemeal Third World War. It might be fragmented and spread over different parts of the world, but it is expanding and involving people from more and more countries. From that level, if we go to the level of humanity as a species, well, I think the United Nations put it very well when they assessed how far we've come in reaching the sustainable, sustainable development goals. They basically said, look, there's a series of interlinked crises that threaten the survival of humanity itself. Now, despair is never a good thing. I mean, you need a, a way out of despair. And at least one way of looking at the sustainable development goals is as a way out of that despair, as something that can give hope. 
Now, I find it very striking that they're not formulated as ideals or values or norms, but as goals. Goals that we can share. Goals towards which we can work, can actually assess how far we've come. It's not very impressive, I must admit. So the idea itself that as humanity, we can formulate goals for ourselves that we share across nations, cultures, communities, and all kinds of differences is a very beautiful idea. Unfortunately, like many of these things, beautiful ideas get transformed into slogans. And when I first started thinking about the SDGs, I thought, okay, I mean, they're kind of checkboxes that you have to tick off when you apply for projects. They're things that you mention in your vision statement as a company, as an organization, but that you soon lose sight of, in many cases at least. So even though they seem to offer a way out of the despair, I mean, you soon come to despair again, because you can, how late? I mean, why did it take us so long to formulate these kinds of goals? And isn't it too late? Okay, we're going to eradicate poverty by 2030, one of the goals. Now, many of you will know that just before the Davos meeting, Oxfam came out with a report which showed that of all the wealth, new wealth that's been created in the past two years since the beginning of the COVID crisis, almost two thirds has gone to 1% of the world population. So 1%, the richest members of our species have grabbed, as Oxfam put it graphically, they have grabbed almost double of what the other 99% got. How can you then take seriously that we're going to eradicate poverty by 2030? It's very easy to become cynical about this, to just say, okay, we'll put that in our project applications, but basically we'll do what we want after it's been put in the application and in the report. But then, I think we would miss out on something that is very important, the sense of these shared goals. And I think a growing sense of urgency, a sense that in order for these goals to become reachable goals, genuine goals, we have to change as human beings. Our behavior has to change. Our actions have to change. But it's very difficult to say how we should change. I mean, what will guide this change? What will guide our actions? How will we change our behavior? Now, let me give four imaginary cases, imaginary individuals. They're only half imaginary. They're kind of composites of existing people. Please don't speculate about their names. First one is a billionaire philanthropist. He's made billions of dollars. And he spends millions, perhaps billions, on projects that contribute to the sustainable development goals all over the world. But he also owns several private jets and flies around the world in those private jets. People calculate his carbon, carbon footprint, and they come to the conclusion that it's 7,500 metric tons per year. OK, one individual. Second individual. This is a UN official. And he's writing reports mentioning the Sustainable <laughs> Development Goals. Actually, in life, he's obsessing over the fact that he should move from P4 to D1 level. 
how I'm go going to get there. How am I going to spend my next rest and recup recuperation period? And why is it taking so long for me to get to D1 and finally get this kind of permanent appointment? Now, our third individual, she's an academic. When she was young, she had very intense experiences meeting refugee children. So she decides to start working on the situation, the welfare, well-being of refugee, refugee children. She starts publishing, doing research, and she becomes successful. Now, as you all know, success is one of the greatest pitfalls of all. So what happens? She gets more and more projects, more and more publications. She's invited to become a member of the National Academy of the Sciences, some other organizations to be on uh, the editorial boards of all kinds of journals and book series. And she turns 50 and suddenly, say, the COVID crisis happens. We all start to think about our lives and the remainder of our lives. She discovers that refugee, refugee children have become a means for her to publish and be successful. Okay. Fourth individual. She's the CEO of a big chemical company who's been there for two decades. And two decades ago, that company already had very clear research results which showed that its products harmed human beings, damaged them, made them ill in terrible ways. Of course, she had to hide those research results. She puts the SDGs in the mission statement and the vision of the company. She has to hide the research results because if she doesn't, the company will get into trouble. Share value will plummet. And she won't get her annual bonus. Now, say, okay, our behavior has to change, our actions have to change. How can your behavior change? I mean, one way of doing so, which is familiar, which has been the most dominant way of thinking about this in Western culture, Western intellectual traditions during the past centuries, is to turn towards moral rules and norms. If you look at the way I describe the situations, you see that there is an implicit norm in the background. Because what do you want to say? See, these people are hypocrites. Now, what do norm, moral norms and rules do? They tell us how we ought to behave. We ought not to be greedy. We ought not to be selfish. We ought to work for the larger good, for humanity, and not just for ourselves. You can go on, formulate any number of rules, norms. The problem is, as I think many of us have experienced, is they don't change our behavior. They do several things. On the one hand, we use them as sticks to beat others with. Like my four individuals, it's very easy to call them hypocrites and say, oh, you keep talking about these SDGs. Look at what you've actually done. You are only interested in your own career, your own money. You are greedy. See what a bad person you are. Now, the obvious question comes, aren't you a hypocrite? And come on, today you come to talk on SDGs, tomorrow you want to order on Amazon and get your, well, you don't have it here in Switzerland, but we have it. So I want some book, I order it, I get Amazon Prime, the next day it comes. If we all do that, the kind of pollution that's created, terrible working conditions for the people delivering the packages. So I'm a hypocrite, I guess, if you describe, it's very easy for me to describe myself in that way, to describe pretty much anyone in that way. 
So we can switch from beating others to self-flagellation. Doesn't get us any further. It only makes us feel bad about ourselves, and then five minutes we'll feel good about ourselves and feel bad again. You get paralyzed instead of changing your patterns of action, changing your behavior. One of the problems with moral norms, with rules, is that it's very easy to also show that you're being moral, to re-describe your own actions and show that there's nothing wrong with them. I mean, the billionaire philanthropist can say, look, I may be flying around, but I am investing billions in clean fuel. And actually, I pay so many million dollars per year for air capture. You know, they get the CO2 out of the air and hide, bury it somewhere. So he gets a kind of moral calculus balance sheet. Actually, I'm very moral. And when I fly, it's to go and find out about malaria in Africa and what's happening in Latin America. So I'm contributing to the welfare of humanity. The academic can tell you, look, to survive is publish or perish. I want to work on the rights and well-being of refugee children. For me to survive, I have to do this. If I don't, there'll be less work on this very important topic. Now you can re-describe the actions of all these people in that way and make them look moral. It just depends on which rule you choose, which kind of moral theory you might prefer. Again, very easy to do so. Another problem with trying to address our current situation in terms of moral rules, moral norms is, what we tend to do is transform the relationship between generations and between cultures into one of moral combat. So, generation which has discovered the right norms, looks at previous generations and says, you boomers, look what you did to us. I mean, look at the world you're passing on to us. And now eight-year-olds call us boomers. And it's a bit painful. I thought my parents were baby boomers, but I'm supposedly a boomer now. Same with cultures. I mean, it's one of our favorite games. You look at another culture. What do you want to show there? How fundamentally oppressive they were. You look at India, you say, oh, see, there's all caste oppression. And that's the relationship between Western culture and, and Indian culture. And you can go to all parts of the world and begin to see the relationship between cultures in terms of this kind of moral combat. Again, it's not going to help us because we lose out on extremely important resources for addressing our current crisis when we do this. We lose out and we try to use something to change ourselves, to change our behavior, change our actions, which doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Sure, sure, don't worry. Now, at the same time, we do not want to transform the sustainable development goals into mere slogans, into boxes that we tick off. So which resources can we draw on to begin to guide our actions, our behavior, to move towards a more sustainable future? Now here, the Dharma traditions come in. I suddenly shouted into the mic. Sorry. I get enthusiastic at some point, so please like, tell me when I'm getting too enthusiastic. So I might now hold forth on the concept of Dharma. The problem is, if you look at the discussion in 
scholarly work. There's all kinds of translations of dharma. Some people, I mean, look at the Encyclopedia Britannica, they'll say it's a moral and religious law, and then go on. Next academic work you take will say it's neither religion, dharma is neither religion nor law. Another academic will tell you it can mean reality, path, thing, law. There's a difficulty we confront in explaining what kind of phenomenon is being, that's being referred to when we talk about dharma. Now, what that shows is we need to do more research. I mean, it doesn't show that we're completely ignorant. It just shows, look, more research needs to be done. But instead of going into what dharma means exactly, I think it'll be more fruitful to look at what these traditions have done, which kinds of concerns they share, whether it's Buddhist, Hindu, Jain, Sikh traditions, different parts of Asia. They do share a set of questions, concerns, ways of gaining insight into human beings, into ourselves. And when we're thinking about how humanity can move forward towards the common goals that we will formulate, I think it's very fruitful, very rewarding to look into what these traditions have done and to look into the kind of learning they've produced. Now, I used ancient wisdom and modern folly in my title. It's a reference to an old article by a moral philosopher called Richard Taylor. He wrote an article, Ancient Wisdom and Modern Folly. Basically, what he said is, look, the way we think about morality today is folly. Because we're talking about rules. No one knows who the rule giver is, why we should obey those rules, what rules we should obey. So he suggested turning back to the ancients, to the Greco-Roman thinkers, virtue ethics, thinking about how to become a good human being, how to live a good life. But Richard Taylor didn't know that there's traditions which are still alive, which are flourishing, which have also been very much concerned with these issues, these goals. And in fact, they start from a common goal that we already share as human beings. And there is a goal we all share. We might not formulate it in that way, but it's becoming happy, becoming happier, at least. If you want to formulate it differently, moving away from unhappiness, moving away from suffering. What do we wish our children, our parents, our friends, be happy? Or at least, please, do not be unhappy. formulated in very simple terms, that's been the concern of these traditions. How can you become happy? How can you flourish as a human being? Now, over centuries, what they developed was a way of teaching how to thoughtfully act thinkingly, to gain insight into our own experience, in such a way that it becomes clear how we should act in the future. Now, this sounds very abstract, perhaps. So let me go back to these four individuals. One of the things that Dharma traditions have done is spend a lot of time thinking about the kinds of goals we put for ourselves as human beings and what the goals and consequences are of our actions. And one of the things they say is, look, it's silly, stupid to put the fruits of our action as though they're goals we should pursue. What do they mean? What are the fruits of our action? Well, say in the case of uh, the academic is success. He's getting published, getting invited, 
becoming famous, gaining a kind of status. Those are fruits of her actions. In the case of the billionaire, it's, well, making lots of money. Again, gaining status by spending this money on philanthropy. What these traditions point out to is when you do this, when you think that these fruits of your action can function as goals, you're doing something that's impossible because they're completely dependent or to a large extent dependent on conditions that are beyond your control. And we are ruled by conditions. For, say, the academic, let's say some new political party or political movement becomes dominant in Europe and refugees are not considered a priority at all. Some new dean or rector is elected in her university and suddenly refugee children are considered are dismissed as a topic for research. No, the success, her fame will crumble. It'll take a couple of months, perhaps, to disappear. Same with the philanthropist. I mean, he might be respected for some time. Once people start harping on his uh, carbon footprint, his reputation will be destroyed. To say, look, private jets are my guilty pleasure. Well, I mean, one man's guilty pleasure is binge watching a Netflix series, another man's guilty pleasure is leaving a carbon footprint of 7,500 metric tons every year. Again, his fame, success, wealth, all of these things depend on conditions external to him. Same with the CEO. Okay, she hides these research results for decades. But then what happens? Some investigative journalist keeps digging, comes out with the results. She's blamed. I mean, that's what these multinationals usually do. She's blamed, fired, and she can never again get a job because her reputation has been tainted. Now, all these people will suffer when this happens because they've become attached to these kinds of external things, the fruits of their action, which are not goals that we can, can pursue, but things that we become attached to. And because they depend on conditions, they come and they go. Inevitably, at some point, they will go. It might take a while. In the meantime, become afraid, oh no, I might lose this. I might lose my reputation, my fame, my status, my wealth. So one of the things that Dharma traditions have done is examine these kinds of situations which are common to human beings in general, which we all face in different ways and in different colors and forms and try to gain experiential insights into them. They're insights into your own experience. They don't function as moral norms. They don't tell you, you ought not to become attached to the fruits of your action. And what would that even, you wouldn't even understand that sentence. They don't tell you, you ought not to be greedy. They tell you, you can pursue wealth, why not? It's one of the legitimate goals. But know that if you become attached to it, you're going to suffer. If your joy depends on this, you'll suffer in the future. Now, once you've gone through some experiences and drawn on these traditions to think about your experiences, these become experiential insights. No one has to tell you, you know, you should not fly around in your jet all around the world playing the big man, and no one will have to prescribe these as rules to you that you should follow. No, they become your own insights, and they will guide your future behavior. 
Of course, it's easy to say, how, how do you avoid becoming attached? That'll be your question, okay? I'm willing to accept. When you get attached to these things, you're going to suffer when you lose them? Absolutely. <coughs> it's true. What should I do? Not be attached to anything? Just become completely detached? These are not my children. They're just children. This is not my wife, my husband. Well, that might work for five individuals, perhaps 10 in this room. It will not work for the rest of us. So then, what do you do with attachment? How do you go about with it? Again, this is something that Dharma traditions have been studying and they've been devising, developing practical ways of dealing with desire. To explain the kinds of insights that they've given us, I need to draw a rough contrast. It'll be rough. When thinking about the sustainable development goals, we often have an implicit conception, an implicit picture in mind of what human beings are like. It tells us that human beings have needs, needs and desires. Many of you will be familiar with this pyramid, you know, Maslow's pyramid. We have basic needs like food, shelter, these kinds of things. And the second level needs, like the need for love, intimacy. And you go to the top of the pyramid, and that's the need for self-actualization, which will keep motivating you. So even if we don't know this specific kind of psychological story, the idea that human beings have needs is widely shared today, not only in Western culture, where it emerged, but it's become a common language. I and mean, just look at the COVID crisis. Lockdown, the people started talking about their needs. I mean, my need for intimate relationships is no longer being fulfilled. I feel very dissatisfied. I mean, in Dutch, a word emerged, het honger, which means it means skin hunger. I mean, it puts those, so it was this hunger for hugging, I don't know, your grandmother or your children or people you knew. And you could no longer do that. So that need was not being fulfilled. So people felt depressed, dissatisfied. Now there's something striking about formulating the problem in terms of needs. It becomes unsolvable. We saw that very clearly in the lockdown. You cannot see people, you cannot touch them, not get close to them. And you claim that, or you experience yourself as a being with needs that have to be filled. Well, you get into an unsolvable problem. Now, these needs are not just requirements. I mean, usually there's a tree outside somewhere. I can't see a tree, but let's imagine there's a tree there. You might say that tree needs water to grow, right? You're not going to say that tree is a needy creature. I mean, intuitively, intuitively, it doesn't make sense. But it does make sense to talk about the human being as a needy creature, a creature with needs. Now, take this as a kind of rough sketch of one conception of what human beings are like. Now, another formulation of that same picture is we have multiple desires. We have desires for food. We have desires for a car, let's say. Now, these desires are multiple in the sense that they have different objects that you desire. And you could say they're doubly qualified. They're, or they have an object, a specific object. I mean, you won't say, I desire. You say, I desire this car. So 
not just a car, you want a Ferrari, let's say. You want the next iPhone 14. Where you have a 2015 MacBook, you say, ah, 16, 15, it's time for a new one. The new M2 chip has come, so I want that. So these are the multiple desires that human beings have. Of course, Dharma traditions do not deny that things appear that way. That they appear as though we have all these different desires which motivate us. But they say, this is only an appearance. Once you start examining desire, you begin to discover that there's only one desire. That there's no multiple desires which are intrinsic to us, which we keep pursuing. No, there's desire with a capital D. And this desire has the characteristic of attaching itself to objects. One day it attaches itself to the iPhone, the next day to a new car, to go and have food in that place, and after you have food to go and have a drink in that, that particular kind of drink in the other place. So it's not the case that we have multiple desires which we can satisfy and therefore we are motivated by those desires. No, there's one desire and the typical property characteristic of desire is that it clings. It clings to objects in the world, including other human beings, including pretty much everything it can cling to, but not that table, I mean. Some things that desire does not tend to cling to. Now, this is a formulation you find in many of these traditions that desire grasps, it clings. Because it does that, it can jump from object to object. It's really indifferent towards which object. In one day, that object, another day, another object. Because of that, it cannot be fulfilled. It can never be satisfied. It's impossible to satisfy. You might have 25. I mean, I have to keep using this example of cars. It might tell you more about my own desires, but even when you have a Lamborghini and a Ferrari and a Porsche and all these, ah, there's that Jaguar E-Type 1965 or the Mercedes SL300 with like, you know, those doors. That, so it keeps on going. And we all, always find something else to order online, right? We convince ourselves that we need it. It's part of the condition humaine. Now, once you realize that you do not have multiple desires, but only this desire, which just attaches itself to all these different things in the world, then you find out, I have to find a way of coping with this desire. If not, it's a recipe for unhappiness. Because I'm going to spend the rest of my life, oh, P4 to D1, you know the next step, no? D2. I mean, I have friends in the United Nations, so I sometimes follow their conversations and they use all these kinds of codes for different levels in the hierarchy. Once you gain that insight, it becomes an experiential insight. It's not like you need to be told, we are all, we all have desires and desires are bad. They make us sinful, you should not pursue them. You don't need anyone else to tell you that. It doesn't become some kind of moral rule that you should follow, no. You begin to find out, okay, if I go that way, I'll suffer. If I do not want to suffer, I'll have to follow another route. In our four cases, you can see very clearly that these people, if they begin to think about their own experience, using 
the insights and the, you could call them heuristics. You know what a heuristic is, it's a, a rule of thumb, a kind of instruction for action. So what these traditions offer is heuristics to start thinking about your own experience as a human being, gain insight into it and change it, restructure it. In the case of desire, they've developed different ways of avoiding it, of going about with it. And there's all kinds of traditions from meditation traditions where you begin to realize that desire and aversion go together with bodily sensations. So if you follow some desire, okay, there's some tingling in your body and you're going to... Once you see that, you begin to feel really stupid. Say, okay, some tingling came, now I want this. And some other kind of sensation came, no, I do not want that. They cannot keep doing that once you realize that this is the case and you see it in your own life and in your own experience. There's traditions of thinking about this, but I ask you, who is the I? Who am I? I keep every second sentence, you talk about this I, either in your head or when you're talking to other people. So to what does this I refer? Start thinking about that. Because you think there's an I that desires all these things. What is that I? Who is that? When you think through using again or drawing on the heuristics offered by these traditions you come to very unexpected results and again they're not results they're not some theory of the ego that you have to memorize when you're studying psychology and two months later you i remember there's some id and then ego and something else super ego rest of the time you forget about it completely so what these traditions can contribute, which is not available in the kind of ethics, moral thinking that is currently dominant, or at least as a way of talking it is dominant, is experiential insights, which you can make your own by thinking about the things you're going through in life. Now, some of these things were also said by ancient Roman and Greek thinkers, like the Stoics. They also said you should not become attached to externals. What they did not have, though, is a range of practical ways of learning how to deal with desire, how to cope with desire, go about with suffering, pain. So their conclusion was, look, the truly wise man, they always used man, the truly wise man comes every 500 years to say, I want to become a wise man. Well, you will not become it. Maybe you'll move like a step up. So the routes they had made available were available only to a very limited group of people. What these traditions tell us is, no, all human beings can become happy. I mean, there are no limitations on whatever kind of human being you may be. You can become happy if you learn how to pursue happiness or how to move away from suffering. And as I said at the beginning, that is a shared goal we have. Now, it's a shared goal if you start making fun of this goal, becoming cynical, then there's no future for you as a human being. I mean, when you make this into a kind of slogan, checkbox on a form, a project application, then you know you'll be lost because the most important goal 
in our lives becoming happier cannot be transformed into this kind of slogan. <coughs> Even if we say we will not reach the sustainable development goals by 2030, and if we are honest, that's just the case, and it would be silly to deny it, There's no need to just drop them. And there's several things we can do. One is, as Mr. Ambassador said, I mean, at least find out where we went wrong, why we have not reached certain things, which errors we made, which mistakes we made, which kinds of ideas, practices are available on which we could draw to move nearer to them by 2050, let's say. Now, of course, the date will keep getting postponed because these are not easy goals to reach. And in the meantime, we're going to go through a very difficult stretch. I mean, there's going to be suffering at a level that we haven't seen before because there's 8 billion of us almost more or less the climate crisis is reaching levels that are frightening. Poverty is growing. You can see it happening uh, in, in Europe. But after the Second World War, the building up of a middle class is what created stability in our societies. Well, that middle class is slowly shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Educational systems all over the world are in big trouble. There's an incredible shortage of teachers. So there is reason to at least be aware that we'll, we, and especially our children and our grandchildren, will have to live in very, very difficult circumstances. And they will suffer. I mean, human beings always suffer, but this will be a kind of suffering that does make us despair. Now, here you have traditions which have thought about human suffering literally for millennia. I mean, not just for centuries. They have thought about how to avoid suffering, how to go about with it, how to move closer, at least, to happiness. And there is a rich storehouse, a variety of practices and ways of thinking that we can explore, which we can transmit and teach to ourselves, to others, to our children, our grandchildren, which will make that very difficult stretch more livable and which will allow us to, to some extent, even flourish, I think, but certainly survive through that very difficult stretch, at the end of which, hopefully, we'll be much closer to the sustainable development goals. Because if we're not, we'll be gone. Let me end there and make it a <laughs> question and answer session. Thank you very much for this stimulating uh, talk. And then we started with the despair, and I find that we're also maybe ending with the despair. So questions, answers, questions. Yeah. 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 I was very happy at the very beginning, you professor raised the point if we can change human beings and how to change it. Now, dharma has been given to people usually through religions. 
and all the religions are directed to only it has one objective how to improve the human being so that he acts behaves well so far you might correct me as a question has have these traditions really changed the world or not now the proof that has not changed that even these traditions are directed to for the benefit of human beings so that they can improve giving human uh humanitarian help is millions of times more than helping the ecology so all these traditions are helping us ourselves i might be wrong but the proof is in my lifetime which is not yet 100 years human population has increased by threefold that means we are benefiting what are we talking about helping the human beings we are expanding now what is not being done in the meantime we are ruining the ecology by 70% now these aspects i think my professor should be brought into the philosophical thinking or dharmic otherwise sustainable future has no meaning in relation to dharma or any religion yeah so uh, the question sorry uh, yeah. i'm you, you sorry i've question. written this in my my website if you want to read it the culprit we find in other things not in the human being we are the culprit we are the virus that is expanding all the time okay so can we so come to the question is that correct or not thank okay. you i don't think the human species is a virus i mean a virus you might try and use it metaphorically but i don't think it's an appropriate metaphor see you can, you can ask you yeah i think we got the point i mean have we harmed our planet and each other of course we have absolutely but there's there's several things that i think are important one is it took us very long to formulate sustainable development goals as goals that we can share individuals or nations now the question we can raise is why did it happen because it did happen and it happened at the level of the un where people from different cultures do meet and do think about some of these problems together so the fact itself that these goals have been formulated shows that something is changing and that other cultures are contributing perhaps in indirect ways but Asians were involved in formulating those goals second is see i don't think we should focus on the fact that these have been transmitted through religions because that gets into a different discussion what is not religion what is religion i find what is important about this is that they have developed knowledge they've developed paths towards knowledge now if something is knowledge all human beings should be able to access it if they are willing to invest the required effort so saying that what they offer is is religion i think misses a very important point they have developed a kind of knowledge from these cultures from these traditions a kind of knowledge has come that is knowledge in the same sense that the sciences are knowledge and not saying that we should say these are also sciences that's not the point but they are accessible 
to people from all religions. I mean, you can be a Christian and do Vipassana meditation. There's no conflict at all. So, yeah. yeah. Can we take another question? Sure. Yeah, yeah please. Just a minute for the mic, because otherwise it doesn't get recorded well. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm a student. I thank you so much for your speech, uh, because you inspired me to think about the question, how to make myself happier. And it is very inspiring. You mentioned that we otherwise be happy or we suffer. So to avoid being suffer, we should not be attached to the desires, but the desires could be in different forms, like a car or a, a mobile phone or a man or a woman, like that. Um, so my question is that um, um, you said that desires, is there is only one desire, but what about the happiness? Is there only one happiness? Or that they always come about the question, like, Today, when I get, I want to get up early, and that would make me suffer. But uh, if I'm late for the class, and then <laughs> I will lose my confidence. So, is there only one happiness, or am I always calculating which can make me more happier? See, I mean, it's an important question because if you ask the question, "What is happiness?" and people start coming up with definitions and their own definitions. It becomes an endless discussion. Now, what, what Dharma traditions have done is focus not on telling you what happiness is, but focusing on our ignorance. I mean, we all want to be happy or at least less unhappy. But we don't have a clue what happiness is. I and mean, we have some vague, we try to replace it with well-being or some other word. But the fact that we're ignorant becomes one of the most interesting aspects of human existence to them and examining what the ignorance consists of. How actually the ignorance puts obstacles in the way of moving towards happiness. And the point is not you should know what exactly happiness is. You should know how to climb over those obstacles or move around them, remove some of them. And for instance, gaining insight into the fact that desire is one and it just keeps attaching itself to all kinds of things can remove one such obstacle. Because if you think I'm a needy creature, I need this, I need that, or I have desires, then it's as though these things are inscribed in you, in your human nature. They're not. So once you discover, hey, desire actually works very differently than I thought, You've removed one obstacle. Same with not getting attached to the fruits of your action. Once you see it, it is really stupid to try and become famous or to try and get status. Because it depends on so many things that you cannot control. You'll get it for five minutes, five minutes later, you write some tweet, you're not, I mean, you haven't slept well, <laughs> you write some stupid tweet, and suddenly you lose all your fame. You're JK, JK Rowling, you're the incredible, most successful author, hero of all these children. You write something on Twitter and suddenly all oh, the children have to ban your books and burn your books. So once you, these insights become your own insights, obstacles on your path towards happiness are being removed. But no one can tell you that is happiness for you. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ruva. Highly appreciate it. Just one question I have. Uh, sometimes I do wonder uh, that the concept which you introduce, of course, that's a very important concept of desire with the capital D. But it's sometimes I feel, I mean, this is my own assessment, I might be 100% wrong, is that majority of uh, culture is basically a learned behavior. Majority of the things which we pick up is in a very impressionable age, up until the age of about 12 to 14. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time we are learning all this, I think we have become like in, in my culture, I come from India, we have become like very hardened pots. You know, a lot of uh, de-learning has to happen in order to relearn again. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think my sense is, you can comment on that, whether that's a good idea or not, uh, is that 
the idea uh, you know these kind of very powerful and subtle ideas which are like the most powerful drivers for human behavior going forward shouldn't they be taught very much in uh, in depth and very properly so that they are ingrained in the minds impressionable impressionable minds of the uh, next generation of humanity let's say till the age of 12 to 14 uh, up until the age of 12 to 14 when the value system is getting generated for people like us mm-hmm. instead of you know the focus being given to people who have come to the age of 30 35 40 45 45 i'm not saying that they should not be they should not be taught uh, and discussed about but shouldn't the education system be driven more towards people understanding or the kids understanding this concept right in, right in the beginning it's just yeah. like buying a iphone and uh, you know reading the user manual 60 years later uh, you know it becomes a little complicated right by the time you have used okay. the iphone okay so in in a generic sense yeah, the answer is yes but then the thing is these are experiential insights i mean without having the experiences you cannot get the insight they just become i mean some formulas or rules <laughs> children haven't had these experiences it's only after you've gone through life I, I, I don't have the book with me. There's a passage in uh, a discourse by the Bodhidharma, you know, the monk who, legendary monk who brought Buddhism to China, where he talks about this depending on conditions. The fact that your fame or your success is actually, it's a seed uh, which you've put in the ground through your actions and it starts flourishing because of conditions and disappears again because of conditions. Five years ago, that wouldn't have said, I mean, told me anything. During COVID, I suddenly realized, Jesus, where are you going in life? And that became a very powerful passage for me. Now, I tried this with my students. I mean, you think, ah, this, now I can explain. My students in Belgium were early 20s. I asked them, do you understand? No. So, I mean, I had two routes to go. I explained it badly, which is too painful for my ego. So instead I said, you don't have the experience. <laughs> so we're hardened pots, but even hardened pots can open up again. And we need to have these experiences to have success and failure before we can really learn these things. Okay, there's, I think we'll just take a couple more questions. Yeah, there. I thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor. It was really nourishing your talk. What, um, as an hypothesis, um, the ancient wisdom, the Dharma tradition talked about the enlightened mind to avoid the duality of what to do, what not to do. Um, I don't know which place you, you give to the enlightened mind, enlightened uh, human being. which avoid this conflict, uh, whether they are personal or, or uh, international. So I'd like to know what is your, your vision about See, this? See, when, when we say that <laughs> happiness is the goal, yes. I mean, you can't find happiness floating around. Mm-hmm. Where is it? In human beings. Mm-hmm. So once in a while you meet someone was truly happy. One of the ways of describing such people is saying they're enlightened. They have enlightened minds. I mean, some people talk about going beyond duality. That's a specific tradition. Right? Uh, so the enlightened mind is the goal that we're working towards. Will we reach it? Let's hope so. There's nothing that prevents us, really, except our own ignorance. <laughs> 